Good morning, folks. Um, just a uh, a quick update is if anybody wants to double up on the Verde Burrito um, offer, um, their HR is trying to find students who want to sit for the English faculty hire tomorrow. So maybe that's more interesting to you to sit through uh, English teaching demonstrations than chemistry, um, or maybe not, but the offer is still good. Anybody who wants a free Verde burrito um, should, uh, should email my wife, Laura, in the HR department, and she'll get you set up with the, the Zoom info. I think it's, it's tomorrow from 10 to 1. So anyone who doesn't have anything going on tomorrow from 10 to 1 um, and feels like sitting through uh, some, some English teaching demos um, for a free burrito, uh, let Laura know. I think they have one student signed up right now, and uh, they would really like more than one student to show up for that. So if you know anybody who's interested as well, um, tell them to, to uh, email my wife. It's in the same email that's on the uh, announcement on Canvas. Um, and if you haven't had one of those burritos before, you're missing out. So, um, yes, Elkie, I do have those syllabi. Um, send me an email and I'll respond um, with, the, with the syllabi. Uh, and if, if you're going anywhere in California, if you need it for transferring anywhere in California, most of most of our CSUs and UCs have already articulated our stuff, so you shouldn't need it for if you're in California. But if you're in Nevada or somewhere else, that's pretty reasonable. Um, so just send me an email, and I'll send you those those syllabi. Cool. Let's get started on. Uh, where's my PowerPoint? There it is. So we're gonna. Finish chapter, I believe it's 17 today. Um, get my screen share going. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, specifically how aromatic compounds show up in NMR and IR, which we've done some work bef with before, but we'll be reviewing that a little bit. And then we'll, we'll get into a few different reactions um, that are specific to um, aromatic compounds, benzenes in particular. From, from here on out, for the most part, when we see, say aromatic, we're going to mean benzene derivatives. Um, as we found out last lecture, there are lots of different aromatic compounds out there. Um, but for the most part, they're going to have some, some of these reactions will be universal to all aromatics and some of them are benzene specific. Um, and we're going to focus on the benzene specific, um, specific ones because for the most part, because there's just not, um, it's by far the most common aromatic compound that we deal with. Um, things like furan and, you know, pyridine and stuff like that. Um, where you've got nitrogen in the ring or oxygen in the ring um, are aromatic and get used as solvents, but at the same time, they're not common in nature and they're not all that common in synthesis because they, they behave very differently in the body than benzene derivatives. Um, and I, I will ask, but I think everybody at this point is fairly familiar with all the technology involved, but everybody's feeling feeling fine about uh, Zoom and submitting things to, to Canvas and, all right, just double checking. Um, at least we're not dealing with Labster, right? My intro students actually are doing pretty well with Labster, but uh, we'll, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, All right, so review of spectroscopy a little bit. So if we're looking at a compound that is, we know to be, have this certain formula, C8H14O4. And we have all this information. We've got proton decoupled NMR. We've got um, carbon NMR with the, the DEPT, carbon NMR which I'll pull up the uh, the textbook chapter on that to remind ourselves how that works. 
we've got the regular proton NMR. I believe this is one of the same examples that we used in the carbon 13 NMR lab, but just reviewing how we, I think this was the last one on that page. Um, where would we start as far as using all of this information to figure out what the structure could be? Uh, could we say that there's no broad spot, so at least there's no alcohol? Perfect. Yeah, look at the IR. There's no alcohol, which means also it's not a um, carboxylic acid, right? And then if we got, I just scribbled over the top of it, but if I clear that and then zoom in, if we draw a line straight up from 3000, I don't think that's a straight line. I believe that everything is to the right of that line. Um, I know what I can do. That looks pretty straight. Basically, we have no we have no CH peaks to the left of that, right? So when we're looking at our IR, our most prominent things we're looking for is OH peaks. Where are the CH? There's almost always going to be CH peaks, right? But they might be if they're to the right of the three thousand number. That tells us that they're sp three carbon hydrogens. And if they're to the left of that three thousand mark. That tells us that they are sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds. So this tells us we don't have any sp3 sp2 carbon hydrogens. What else do we look for? It's been a bit. Even if you don't remember the specific numbers, what functional groups should we look for? What else stood out? Uh, carbonyl carbons, things like ketones and... Carbonyls, exactly. So C, double bonded, oops. C double bonded to O. Always show up just above 1700. So we probably have carbonyl carbons. We don't have any sp2 carbon hydrogens. We don't have any hydroxyls. And that's about all we're looking for, really, when it comes to the, the IR, right? Are those three, maybe four things, OH, what kinds of carbon hydrogens we have, and carbonyls are the most obvious things to look for. Um, and that does tell us, that combined with the, with the formula tells us a fair bit about the, the molecule, right? Let me clear this and zoom back out. If it's C8H14, the formula itself tells us something. Can we have a benzene ring? If it's C8H14? No, because it's at most two degrees of unsaturation, right? Which means either it's either got two ring structures or two um, double bonds. And at least one of those double bonds is a carbonyl, right? So no benzenes, at least one carbonyl, no OHs. So we're looking at maybe some, maybe ethers, maybe esters, no carboxylic acids, though, no alcohols. So if we're taking notes on this and we want to keep an eye on, okay, we know it's maybe 
we probably have at least one ester, maybe two esters. Maybe an ether. It would have maybe a different carbon, maybe a ketone instead. But it seems pretty likely we'd have an ester. And we look at the proton NMR, that tells us a lot too, even before we start looking at where the peaks are, how many, how many unique types of um, protons are there? Only three, right? So we have 14 protons, but only three types of protons. So this tells us that there's a lot of symmetry somewhere a lot of these protons are gonna wind up being um, this equivalent. And same with the carbons, right? If we, if we ignore the DEPT-135 because we, we haven't gone back to review, I'm trying to move my Zoom stuff around. Um, the normal, proton decoupled carbon NMR, we ignore the solvent, only has four types of carbons, right? And we have eight types of carbons total. So that tells us that a bunch of our carbons are equivalent to each other. In other words, we have a lot of symmetry again. So ignoring the DEP, the DEPT for a second, what do we know about these different protons? What do the proton NMR and the splitting tell us? Isn't it like the height has to do with how many protons are on that carbon and then the splitting is like the neighboring protons or something? Good, so the, the integral, not just the height, the integral, which is the red line here. So it's the height of the red line is gonna tell us how many protons are in that signal. And the splitting tells us about how many protons are next door. So, if we're just looking up here, I might have to get out a, a ruler to be, for, be sure on the integral, but these look pretty close to the same height, right? And this one is significantly more than the others. So when, it, when the integral is drawn that small, it's kind of hard to see. And you might have to get out a ruler or you know hold your finger up to the to the screen and measure um, as best you can to get a, a rough idea. Yeah, those are about the same, those first two on the left. But the splitting is going to tell us something. We've got one one carbon uh, hydrogen peak that is that has no splitting at all. So what does that tell us about how many hydrogens are nearby? Nothing nearby, all by himself. Right, it's that N plus one rule, right? The N plus one rule says that um, for, you, if you take the number of peaks that are split up and subtract one, that's how many hydrogens you have nearby. Or flipping around the, the context, if the number of hydrogens nearby plus one is the number of peaks that you will see. So if we see a peak all by itself with no splitting, that means that it's there are no hydrogens nearby. And if we have a quartet, that means that it's next to something with three hydrogens. So a quartet is usually 
indicates that it's next to a CH3 group. And a triplet usually indicates it's next to a CH2 group. And that one with no splitting means it's next to nothing. Well, it's next to other carbons, but not carbons that have any hydrogens on. It. So we have ester, at least one ester, a high degree of symmetry. We've got a carbon that's next to no hydrogens. So probably what we're going to see here with this high degree of symmetry it's going to be something like um, something like a CH2 in the middle of, of an ester, or with an ester on each side, maybe. But there's going to be something that tells us um, how we can arrange these things here. We know we probably have two ethyls a CH2 next to a CH3, right? So if we zoom out and start writing what the possibilities are, we know we've got a, or we're pretty sure we have an ester, at least one. We're pretty sure we've got probably two CH2, CH3s. So here's where the DEPT can really help us. Let me pull up the textbook on that. So if we go to the NMR section. Here's our DEPT. Here's our little cheat sheet. Signal patterns for DEPT carbon NMR. If it's 135, a CH3 shows up as upward peak, CH2 is downward, CH is upward and a carbon with no hydrogens on it won't show up. Remember this DEPT was carbon 13 NMR where you're coupling it to the number of hydrogens. You're treating the signal mathematically so that the number of hydrogens, it's gonna make it either show up, up, down, or not at all. So if we come back to our slide, so it's an odd number of hydrogens makes it go upward. So that does correspond to here, our triplet that we looked at before was the most shielded. And that's also what we see here that our, we have an odd number of hydrogens um, on this first one. So that is our CH3. The ones that show up downward, are both gonna be CH2. So we have two CH2s, two unique CH2s, one of which has no splitting, meaning it has no nearby protons. So how can we use some esters and what we know so far And this must be a carbon that doesn't have any hydrogens attached to it. It's very de-shielded. 
So we took, if we checked our um, list of characteristic frequencies, we'd see that that's a carbonyl carbon. We might even be able to get more specific than that and say that it's specifically an ester carbon. There's the textbook. I know I've, all my scribbling is on top of this, but we just want if we just want to check the chemical shifts. Uh, they have a good list on here for. Common functional groups, no. Check inside the front cover. PKA values, nope, not on this textbook. So if we check a different, let's let's just double check that we can't get more specific with that. Um, with that tech or with that specific uh, chemical shift there. Actually, where's that? figure from compound chemistry. Put it under posters. So esters should show up in the 160 to 180 range. 160 and that's 175. So we're right in the right range for it to be an ester. So likely we have two esters, two ethyl groups. How could we arrange all this? Maybe like an anhydride? Maybe an anhydride, except an anhydride would give us an odd number of hydrogen of uh, oxygens right and anhydride has three oxygens in the functional group and plus let's see anhydrides aren't separately called out on here um but anhydrides i would expect to be a little bit more de-shielded but anhydrides are symmetrical so that's a good thing to be paying attention to So remember, when we get to this point, if we're not seeing exactly how we can do it, try start, tr just try drawing figures, try drawing structures, and then ruling them out. So high degree of symmetry, two ethyl groups. My first, my first thought might be something that looks like. And then repeat it again. One, two, three, four. Is that going to work? It fits most of our criteria. But what's what's wrong what's not going to work about it you don't have any of the carbons that are uh or for the proton nmr that's all by itself exactly these are both ch2s which one would mean they would both show up in that dept you would have ch2 signals that showed up as ch2s in the dept um, and we have nearest neighbors here. So that singlet would really should would show up as a triplet if this was what we had. So that has the right amount of symmetry. What else could we do? 
We didn't have any CH1s though, did we? And we couldn't have, let's see, there's, we have one, two, three carbons drawn this way, which means we would need five carbons spread around. That's not gonna give us the right amount of symmetry if we put one carbon in the middle, right? We have an even number of carbons. Go back to what we're looking at here. How could we do that? I'm going to let that let's let that marinate for a second. You guys solved this one before, so it's doable. All right, I'm going to, I think I know what it is, but I'm going to make sure I'm not missing anything by checking the solutions manual before I steer you guys down the wrong path. So you guys continue to keep trying to do this i'm just going to mute for a second and pull up um pull up your solutions from last quarter and we'll go over it I was wrong. You guys solved the one that was the anhydride that was C C eight H fourteen O three, which was an which is the, the anhydride around the middle. What if we put them put a methyl at the end? Ah, uh, that wouldn't give us the right number of nearest neighbors, right? We couldn't have a CH3 at the end by itself. And plus, what if, or so what if we did, we don't have any CH, any CHs. They're all CH3, CH2, or no hydrogens. I got an idea. I don't really know how to verbally explain it, though. 
Okay. Give it a shot, or you can draw it if you want. Um, or just I tell think, me how to draw it. Yeah, I'm, I'll just try showing the drawing if, if you can see that at all. So an ester, a ketone, and an ether. Maybe. The problem with that is that the, you don't have the, enough. It, it fits everything except for the symmetry. You would have way more than just four carbon, different carbons, right? Because those two carbonyl carbons are going to show up differently. Because you've got a carbonyl carbon that's an ester and a carbonyl carbon that's a ketone. We'll come back to this one. Let it let it sit in your subconscious when we while we do some other stuff, and then we'll come back to it after break. Not as satisfying as solving it now, but you have a better chance of doing it yourself. Um, any specific questions on the review? I think we got through that pretty well on in lab on Tuesday. Um, if anybody had any any uh, nagging questions you weren't quite sure about i actually haven't looked at it did uh did you folks get get it turned in at all that's one of you did the rest of you still finishing some stuff up yeah haven't turned it in yet but pretty much wrapped it up all right <clears throat> let's go on to some some reactions for benzene. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, benzene's really non-reactive. We've talked about that a fair bit. Uh, if you put benzene with a strong oxidator, oxidizer like dichromate or chromic acid, that oxidizes pretty much, pretty much anything um, except for benzene. It behaves a lot like an alkane when it comes to putting it with a strong oxidizer. Um, however, if you put a, a carbon that's attached to a benzene and you expose it to dichromate, you can oxidize the benzylic carbon. And this is actually winds up being one of those reactions where we can modify the carbon skeleton. Um, because any alkane that's attached to a benzene ring, that benzylic position winds up being having a lot of resonance, right? And so it actually behaves differently than either benzene by itself or an alkane by itself. If you put if you have a carbon in the benzylic position and you expose it to dichromate, it turns it to benzoic acid every time, no matter how big that carbon chain is. If you put it with, with dichromate or with chromic acid, um, you're going to wind up basically chopping off all the other carbons and you turn it into benzoic acid. If you had more than one carbon chain attached to a benzene ring, it'll do that in every position. Right? So this is a very specific reaction to aromatics. And this, this is one of those reactions that will actually apply to most aromatic compounds. If you have, say, furan, and furan is the one that looks like this. If you had furan with a carbon chain attached to it, it'll do the same thing. It'll chop off the rest of this and add a carboxylic acid there. But for the most part, we're going to talk about it in the context of benzene. So that's a really easy reaction to draw the products of. There's nothing tricky like Diels Alder or anything like that. There's no stereochemistry involved. Um, however, this only works if there's a hydrogen on the benzylic carbon. 
So whatever the mechanism is, hi the hydrogen on the benzylic carbon must play a role. So for with a lot of these oxidation reactions, we don't wind up going super in detail on the mechanisms because a lot of times the mechanisms are very convoluted um, and involve lots of steps um, when we're dealing with these metal oxida uh, oxidizing agents. Um, in this one in particular, though, we can not even go out of limb. We can say, well, we know that the hydrogen plays a role because if you try to oxidize, if you try to oxidize T-butyl benzene, it doesn't work because the benzylic carbon has no hydrogen there. Right, but any other case, no matter what is attached, no matter what carbon chains attached, if there's a benzylic hydrogen, you can oxidize it to benzoic and it goes to benzoic acid every time. You just lop off the rest of the molecule. And we basically, the, the rest of the molecule gets oxidized fully, most likely gets turned all the way into CO2. Um, so we can't really use this we can only use this reaction in synthesis if we care about the aromatic side, but not the rest of it. If we want the rest of the molecule involved, this doesn't work. So let's practice. I'll give you guys a few minutes for each of these. All the carbons that have benzylic hydrogens are going to get turned to a carboxylic acid. So give that a go, and then I'll fill it in. And so A is not so bad, right? Toluene, you put it with dichromate. You get benzoic acid. For B, you have two benzylic carbons, and they both get turned into carboxylic acids. 
for C, we have three benzylic carbons, but one of them doesn't have a hydrogen attached. So this T-butyl group won't get oxidized. So our T-butyl group stays where, the way it is. Getting acid up here. And an acid right there. Can you, sorry, why does that not react again? Is it just because it's got, it's tertiary or? It's because there's no hydrogens on that benzylic carbon in okay. order for this to work. So that's not just a, a tertiary carbon, that's a quaternary carbon, right? Which means there are no hydrogens attached. So regardless of what else is attached on here, if it's, if we had other carbons there, it doesn't matter. All that matters is does the car carbon that's next to the benzene have a hydrogen? Okay. If there's no hydrogen attached, then you can't oxidize it this way. Okay. Other than that, that's the only caveat with this, with this reaction. Other than that, if there's a carbon, turn it into carboxylic acid. The next reaction that we're going to look at and actually we can we have 7 minutes left before I want to take a break so let's go back to that NMR1 let's finish that up before we add a new reaction in so as, as you should when you get stuck, if we go back to the textbook chapter on this on the splitting, we thought we had one that one structure that worked with everything except for the splitting, right? If we had two carbons in the middle and then we had two esters and then we had two ethyls on the outside, that worked for our formula, that worked for our functional group. It just didn't work because we have a singlet here. So, but if you go back and read the chapter on splitting, it tells you that if you have protons that are equivalent to each other on the carbons next door, it doesn't cause splitting because they're identical to each other. You can't tell the difference between them, which is why if you have a benzene ring, and all the hydrogens are equivalent to each other, they all show up as one peak, despite the fact that they have ne nearest neighbors. The fact that they're all identical to each other tells you that it's only going to be, you're, you're not gonna see any splitting in that case. So our first structure that we drew that matched everything but one piece of information was actually right. It's two carbons in the middle, two esters, and then two ethyls on the outside. So something like one, two, three. Oh, forgot an oxygen. No, that's short of carbons. There we go. It's either that or having the esters flipped so that the carbonyl is here and the, and the oxygen is there. Because these are both CH2s, which is why they show up on the DEPT as, as being um, CH2s. But the fact that these two are identical to each other means that they won't cause splitting. And now we're we're splitting hairs, haha. -ha. 
I would say no pun intended, but it occurred to me as I said it, and I said it anyway. So, um, but when as we get into looking at that's a worthwhile review of how splitting works, because as as we start getting into aromatics in NMR, that's going to make a difference, right? Because that means that the the lack of splitting on a benzene ring can tell us that all of the hydrogens on a benzene ring are identical to each other. As far as bet deciding between the two possibilities here, the other possibility would be carbonyls on the outside. So basically just switching the two the two cases here or the two esters and these are going to be hard to tell the difference between um, other than we would expect We would expect the ones that are more, let me go back to my, the, uh, the ones that are more de-shielded are going to be the carbons that are directly attached to the oxygen. So when we're deciding between these, back to share screen again. Our, we have two CH2s that were approximately, that were pretty close to each other, but the one that's next to the methyl group, the one on the outside is more de-shielded, which means that that's the, that's the carbon and the hydrogens that are directly attached to the oxygen. So this structure works better, the top one, where you have your carbonyls on the inside and then your ethyls are directly attached to the oxygen. And that's what makes that CH2 more de-shielded than the ones that are in the middle. So if you had that bottom red structure, that singlet would be further to the left? Exactly. If we had the bottom red structure, we would expect the quartet and the singlet to be switched. And that's when you've got everything down and you've got two possibilities, the, the de-shielding winds up being a good way to decide. It's not all that helpful on its own until you get to this point. But once you get to this point, the de-shielding is what is you know, your final judgment between these two. Um, I, mean, I shouldn't say the de-shielding is not useful because the de-shielding is really useful for seeing if we have an aromatic ring, for instance, or if we have a, an aldehyde because they show up in really specific areas. But when it comes to the different alkanes, um, the de-shielding is what's going to allow us to decide between more or less equivalent structures. All right. Let's take a break and then we'll come back and we will review other benzylic reactions. And then we'll talk about how we can break up the aromaticity. So let's come back at nine.
All right, let's start bringing it back. So this is a rather confusing looking um, roadmap, but it's basically just a review of how we can um, convert various alkyl benzenes into different functional groups. Um, specifically, they're, if you're starting from benzene with an alkyl group on it, you really only have two options at this point as to how we're going to turn that into something else. Um, you can either go through the oxidation reaction that we just went through and the shorthand that you see, because there are multiple strong oxidizing agents that can be used. Dichromate is probably the most common, but chromic acid and various others as well. And so sometimes you will just see the reaction written as, as an O in brackets. That, that symbol in OCAM just means we're going to oxidize it. Um, there, it's not the most ideal way to do it because it doesn't specify if it's a strong oxidizing agent or not, but it's just a, a common shorthand. So um, I want you guys to be aware that that exists. And when in doubt, if it says, says oxidize it, you're just you're adding oxygen somehow or you're adding carbon oxygen bonds. Um, if we're not going to just oxidize it to benzoic acid, like we just with the reaction we just talked about, um, the only other reaction we really have that puts a functional group on a benzylic carbon is radical bromination. So that would be going back to what, what chapter was free radicals chapter nine, um, nine or 10, one of those two, um, but so expose it to bromine with light or expose it to NBS um, with light and you're going to be you're going to put a bromine preferentially in the benzylic position because of all the resonance stabilization you get. And once we get there, there's all sorts of things we can do, right? All of our other reactions. Excuse me. It's my coffee. All of our other reactions for alkyl bromides still apply now. So we can do SN1, SN2 to convert it to an alcohol or to a thiol or to, to an ether. Um, we can do an E1 or E2 if it's something, if we've got more than one carbon there, we can have it go through an elimination reaction and make um, a double bond. This is all just review though, this is nothing new. So all of when you guys were pouring through all of your reactions for your uh, for your synthesis project at the end of last quarter, um, you probably saw most of these and thought about these reactions. These are some of our most common reactions when it comes to how do we convert reaction or uh, functional groups. If we want to talk about reactions of the benzene ring itself. There's not a whole lot that goes on. Like I mentioned, benzene rings are exceptionally stable. Um, we can force it to be hydrogenated, but it takes way more extreme conditions. Um, if we wanted to hydrogenate an alkene, we could just say expose it to a catalyst and some hydrogen and you get, you get the alkane, right? If we want to fully hydrogenate benzene and take it all the way from being benzene to being cyclohexane, um, we can do that with three equivalents of hydrogen. We need nickel as a catalyst. We need heat. And it has to be at about 100 atmospheres of pressure, um, which is doable in an, in an industrial setting. And even in a lab, if you have the right, um, the right uh, reactor, um, in, um, is actually, if you've ever... I'm sure every, all of you have heard the term a reactor before, usually in the context of a nuclear reactor, right? Um, reactor is actually a chemical engineering term that just means where the reaction happens. So if you have a very, very um, strong, thick-walled stainless steel reactor, um, you can have this reaction happen in a lab. You just have to keep adding hydrogen to the point where you get up to that 100 atmospheres mark. Um, 
and it's exothermic once you get it to that point. You can get decent yields on it. Um, it's just really hard to get the reaction started. And under most circumstances, we'd like to not have to get up to 100 atmospheres of pressure. Um, so if we want a, a different way of breaking the aromaticity, we have to get a little more creative. Um, but this also means that we can reduce, we can break up the pi bond and hydrogenate alkenes that are attached to benzene rings without affecting the benzene ring. Under normal reaction conditions, we're just going to ignore the benzene ring when it comes to hydrogenating things, which is kind of helpful sometimes because it gives us that, that key um, term there. We like selectively. In synthesis terms, selectively is a good thing to be able to hydrogenate one part of the molecule, but not the rest of it is a very helpful thing to have. Um, so this is the tool that does get used um, specifically. And, um, and that also allows us to um, do things like use an alkyne as a nucleophile, for instance, to add carbons to the carbon structure and then remove the alkyne by hydrogenating it, but leave the benzene ring alone. Right, so there's a lot of practical uses in terms of synthesis for this. If we want to break the aromaticity, though, we have to go through the most common way to do that is through a reaction called the birch reduction. And the birch reduction is a way of removing one of those pi bonds. It's a it's a kind of an odd mechanism. It requires sodium metal and a proton source, and you have to do it in liquid ammonia as your, as your solvent. Um, but we can actually break up a benzene ring into two isolated alkenes. So remember, isolated an is isolated diene means that there's there's no resonance between the two. So not only did we break the aromaticity, there's no resonance left either because these two alkenes have sp3 carbons in the way. So in this birch reductions mechanism actually is, it makes a lot of sense and similar to the dissolving metal reaction that we saw before. Remember the dissolving metal reaction was sodium metal in liquid ammonia the sodium metal, what, is, what does sodium do to become more stable? Why is it so unstable? Because it oxidizes violently. It oxidizes violently. And oxidation is another way of saying what? You're adding carbon oxygen bonds? I don't know. Yes, I meant more in the gen chem sense. When you first learned about what, what oxidation and reduction was, what did we, we said, uh, Leo Losing says her, right? Yeah. Losing yeah. electrons. So, the, so basically, the sodium metal is a really, really good source of electrons from the organic point of view. If you put sodium metal with something, it's going to give your organic compound extra electrons. And the, if you put it with benzene, the only place you can put those extra electrons is on is by breaking one of those pi bonds, essentially. If you break one of those pi bonds, then you can have one pair of electrons on one carbon, and then you can add the extra electron onto the other carbon. And so, and that's what we see. So this is chapter 17. Um, I think this is the only mechanism in chapter 17 that we're gonna go over, um, that extra electron from sodium, it oxidizes so violently that you can force that extra electron to jump onto a benzene ring. And that all of a sudden is going to limit your, your resonance, right? Because all of a sudden we go from um, all of these sp2 carbons, and now one of the carbons is stuck being sp3, and really two of the carbons are stuck being sp3 because they have extra electrons they can't do anything with. 
And so we essentially just wind up with a bunch of single electron arrows. Remember the, the arrows that are drawn with a single barb mean a single electron is moving. And so we have these single barbed uh, arrows showing a single electron moving, and we wind up with the, the two unstable parts of the, of the benzene ring now wind up being on opposite sides from each other. You wind up with the extra, actually switch color so it's not being confused here. You wind up with the extra pair of electrons, the negative charge on one side of the molecule, and then you have a free radical on the other side of the molecule. And they're gonna basically try to stay as far apart as possible because their electrons push away other electrons. So you're you're separating the unstable, the unstable parts of the molecule. And then you wind up with the part of the benzene ring that has a full negative charge winds up grabbing a proton from, from any proton source nearby, usually methanol is used. And then we wind up with doing the same thing to the opposite side, except now we, it's a little bit like a propagation step from free radical reactions. We have a free radical, actually, I take it back to the termination step, because we have a free radical sitting around here. And so it just finds another sodium atom that can donate a single pro, a single electron once again. And so you wind up um, with a sodium atom, which is a free radical itself, giving its extra electron to the radical, what was a benzene. And then you wind up with another anion again, which can steal another proton. So it's kind of the the same two steps. Sodium gives away an electron and that makes that radical anion. The anion grabs a proton. Sodium gives away another electron to the radical to make another anion, which grabs another proton. And so they have them labeled as nucleophilic attack, but it's really, it's, it's a free radical step. And so it is, it is a nucleophilic attack. You're trying to give away electrons, um, but it's not a nucleophilic attack the way we think about SN1 and SN2, right? It's a free radical step because that sodium is, has a single electron and is trying so hard to give it away that it can force the benzene to take that extra electron, even though that breaks the, the aromaticity. And so the, the net result is always going, going to be the isolated diene. You broke one of the pi bonds and left the other two. And you wind up with them being separated by these sp3 carbons. This makes things interesting when it comes to predicting reactions a little bit, though, because that means that we have, we went from all of our carbons being identical to each other to having two distinct types of carbons on this ring structure now, right? Which means knowing where we're gonna put the sp3 carbons versus the sp2 carbons winds up being a big deal because if we have a, a methyl group here, does the methyl group wind up on an sp2 carbon or does it wind up on an sp3 carbon or does it wind up on both? And so, Turns out that depends on the character of the substituent. So this is, I promised we were gonna get back to using that term electron withdrawing and electron donating. Here's the first place where we're gonna see it. If you have an electron donating substituent, your electron donating substituent is always going to be on one of those alkenes. And if you have electron withdrawing substituent, it's always gonna be on one of the sp3 carbons. So quick review of what is electron drawing, withdrawing versus electron donating. Basically anything with pi bonds is gonna be electron withdrawing 
and anything that's a halogen is going to be electron withdrawing. Everything else, if it's all single bonds, it's going to be electron donating. So the most common electron donating are going to be R groups, meaning alkyl groups. It's going to be um, anything with single bonds. An electron withdrawing is anything with conjugated pi bonds. So anything with a pi bond is going to wind up being on the sp3 carbon. Anything that's electron donating is going to be on an sp2 carbon. And this does wind up somewhat making sense, because if you have an electron withdrawing, if we go back to the mechanism for a second, if this hydrogen was replaced by an electron withdrawing, substituent, it's, that means it's pulling electron density away from that carbon, right? If it's pulling electron density away from that carbon, that makes it a better target for the sodium. The sodium electron is going to be more attracted to that because the electron withdrawing substituent is basically opening up a spot for it. But if you have electron donating group, you get the exact opposite happening. Electron donating groups are giving electron density to that carbon. And if they're giving electron density to that carbon, that makes it harder for the sodium to also give an electron. Right, so electron donating stays on the pi bond. Electron withdrawing goes to this, is going to be on an sp3 carbon. So let's practice that. Remember, if it's an R group, if it's just an alkyl group, that's electron donating. I'll see if I can, while you guys are working on these, I'll see if I can find a good figure that has a list of electron donating versus electron withdrawing.
So this is an, in next chapter, we're going to get into a lot of talking about electron donating and withdrawing, um, which is where this got the best list of things that are, they call them activators and deactivators. Um, if it's an activator, it's electron donating. So basically everything above this line is electron donating. And so it's anything where you don't have a conjugated pi bond with the benzene ring. Anything where you've got a conjugated pi bond next to the benzene ring is going to be, um, is going to be electron donate, sorry, electron withdrawing, including halogens. Halogens are electron withdrawing groups as well. But for the most part, we're looking at pi bonds. The halogens are sort of the exception um, because they're electron withdrawing, but they don't have pi bonds. So for the most part, we're just looking at pi bonds. So let's look at A. In this case, we're trying to, we're going to be left with a isolated diene for A. And where is, pull up mold view. So we're still going to be, we're still going to have the overall structure here of a cyclohexyl group. We're breaking the benzene ring, and we need the electron donating group is going to stay on a pi bond. So a couple ways we could draw it. We could draw it that way. That's really no different than if I drew it. If I drew it the other way, we get the same molecule, right? That's the same molecule. So in this case, we're going to, we have to put the two S, the new SP3 carbons have to be opposite of each other. And neither one of them can be right here where the isopropyl is attached. So this would be our product. If we, let me get the cyclohexane oriented properly. If we have the isopropyl in the same spot and a methyl on the opposite side, they both need to be on a pi bond. So they, and they, the methyl group or the alkyl groups still have to be opposite of each other. And is there any difference between those two? Are they the same molecule or not? No, they're the same. Yeah, they are the same. Picture grabbing them on the alkyl groups and spinning it in that that ring would flip over, but your alkyl groups would stay in the same spot, right? And that would give you, that would allow you to switch back and forth between these if you just flipped it like a pancake. How about C? We know we're going to get something that looks like this. So if we put this in the same spot, does that work? And is it going to be any different? Is there any other way we could arrange that? 
if the two if the two sp3 carbons have to be opposite of each other this is the only place you could put them right because if you put the sp3 carbon here it would be opposite of the methyl group and that wouldn't work we put the sp3 carbon here then the opposite one would go where the isopropyl is attached and that wouldn't work So where we put the pi bonds when we're done is a little bit tricky because we're not moving where the substituents are. It's just a matter of, okay, where do we put these two opposite sp3 carbons so that everything can be satisfied? Since while I have it here, let's look at F. So F. We've got an electron withdrawing group. So the electron withdrawing group needs to be on an sp3 carbon. So our pi bonds have to go in a spot where they're not interfering with that. So both of your substituents wind up being happy in this case. Right? The electron withdrawing group is on an sp3 carbon. The electron donating group is on a pi bond. There's almost always a way that you can arrange these so that both substituents are happy at the same time. I mean, we know I'm not really, I don't really mean happy. They're not, they don't have emotions, but can be, can be stable. We can satisfy both of these conditions at the same time. So let's, let's look at D next. We've got an isopropyl and a methyl that are adjacent to each other, that are ortho relative to each other. They're both electron donating groups, so they both need to be on a pi bond. So the only place that we can put our sp3 carbons is here, right? Or is right there. So our pi bonds have to go there and there. It's a bit of a, of a logic puzzle. How do I satisfy all of these criteria at the same time? Takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's, it's not too bad when you get the hang of it. And then last but not least, if we have our electron withdrawing group, here it needs to go on an sp3 carbon. So that, that doesn't give us a lot of options. We have to put an sp3 carbon here, which means the other sp3 carbon has to go here. Right? And, and really, we, and we wind up, we're not making a new stereo center in this case because we wind up with two identical substituents. Both directions around the ring in this case are identical. But if we were making a new stereo center, we would just be making both enantiomers of it. All right, questions? I think you just answered it. Just gonna ask about the stereochemistry, but you get both. Yeah, so for instance, for F, when we get, if we wind up with something where we've got 
Uh, so they're meta relative to each other. So we wind up making this compound for F. We're going to wind up with both versions of it. We're going to wind up with that stereoisomer as well as the opposite. So both of those versions of the same thing for F, the R and the S. And this is one that's happening in liquid ammonia with sodium and a proton source? Correct. So this is, so you will frequently just see it referred to as, then we perform, performed a Birch, react, or Birch uh, reduction. Um, and the way that, that is done is with this with the metal sodium metal with stoichiometric amount of methanol in liquid ammonia as the solvent right so it's this is all happening under these conditions oddly enough as nasty as that all sounds that's actually sometimes easier to do in a lab than getting getting things to 100 atmospheres of hydrogen gas at 150 Celsius. Um, dealing with sodium metal and liquid ammonia is actually safer in many cases because you're doing this to get liquid ammonia, you have to be at low temperatures. And low temperatures are almost always safer than high temperatures, especially when you're dealing with really high pressures. What if you had a three electron withdrawing, withdrawing substituents on the ring? So then we get into um, just how strong of an electron withdrawing agent they are. If they're so the ones at the bottom, they're deactivators. So the deactivators slow things down, and activators speed things up. Um, but basically, the more strongly electron withdrawing something is, the more it needs to be on the sp3 carbon. So if you can only satisfy some of your substituents, you satisfy the strongest ones first. And actually usually you look at it from the other way. You look at what's the most strong the most strong electron donating group first. Because a donating group is an activator. Actually this is for aromatic substitution. So for ours because we need that first step is an electron is a nucleophilic attack we would look at what's the strongest electron withdrawing group and make sure that that's the one that gets sp3. And then if you, um, and that's really sort of the approach that you have to take with that. So for instance, if we, let's say we had a benzene ring with a moderate electron withdrawing group and a very strong electron withdrawing group. So nitro groups are very strongly electron withdrawing. And bromines are electron withdrawing, but not that strong. If they're in opposition to each other, if I can't satisfy both of them at the same time, you satisfy the most strongly electron withdrawing first. <clears throat> now on a test, I'm not gonna give you, I guess this be an open book test, maybe I will, because we will have covered the next chapter and gone over um, that table and how to use it in more detail by then. Um, but the, the general trend is what you're gonna wanna pay attention to. And on a standardized test, they're probably not gonna give you one that conflicts with itself. If you were taking up the chemistry GRE or MCAT or you know any of those um, that that require some amount of OCHEM, um, you're going to get questions that focus that are not contradictory for the most part. But if we so if we did go through this, we would wind up with 
So the bromine's still in the same place. The nitro group is still in the same place. The nitro group has to be has to be satisfied first because it's more strongly electron withdrawing. So it's better at de-shielding that carbon and allowing the sodium electron to come and jump in. So remember, that's what's starting this whole reaction is you have to have a target for the sodium electron to jump in. So because the, um, the nitro group is better at making the target, we would wind up with this being our product. We might see a little bit of the other product, but it'd be pretty tiny amount. All right, any other questions about birch reductions at this point? Like I said, this chapter is pretty light on on uh, new reactions, basically just had the, the benzylic oxidation and the birch reduction are the only new reactions we're adding this chapter. So the main skills that we learned from this chapter are, how can you tell if something's aromatic? These two new reactions, and then we're gonna talk a little bit for the last 15 minutes about um, spectroscopy of aromatics. So some, a lot of that's gonna be review. Um, if we're looking at benzene rings in, in the aromatics, there's not necessarily anything that's super easy. It's not like an alcohol where there's a smoking gun. You can absolutely look at an IR of anything that's an alcohol and say, oh, boom, there's an alcohol. Um, it's a lot harder to do that with aromatics, <clears throat> but there are some clues I don't like to consider the ones that are all the way down here in the fingerprint region. There's a couple right around 1500 that, that show up sometimes, but sometimes they get buried in the um, fingerprint region as well. But the two keys that almost always show up if you've got a benzene ring is you wind up with some really weak peaks in the right around just under 2000 region, but they wind up, they're somewhat regular. They call those overtones because it basically has to do with the different versions of the resonance structures you, that you can see and the way that they interact with each other like waves. So they use the same ter term as overtones, which is a musical term, um, meaning when you get more than one harmonic happening on the same string at the same time. And so because of the resonance that you can get, um, when you've got an aromatic compound, you get these overtones where you get a bunch of small peaks, but they're all, they're very regularly spaced. And again, they, you're not always going to see those, but if you look closely, they should be there. And so if you're pretty sure you've got a benzene ring based on the formula or based on some other pieces of information, if you dig in there and look very carefully, you might see those. Sometimes they get covered up by stronger peaks, though. The other place that you always are going to see some evidence of, of benzene is, is where you also would see evidence of alkene carbon hydrogens, though, um, is in that just above 3,000 range. Just above 3,000 is where you see the carbon hydrogen bonds, where your hydrogen is attached to an sp2 carbon. And so that's that's not a smoking gun, but it, it's at least suggestive. If you have a benzene ring, these have to be there. Just because these are there doesn't mean you have a benzene ring, if that makes sense. It will definitely be there if you have a benzene ring that has any hydrogens at all on it, but it's possible to have other compounds that also have peaks in this region, if it's an alkene, for instance. But those overtones are a pretty good clue, especially if you have really a proton NMR is the best way to tell if you've got aromatic. Because if you've got a proton NMR, they always show up in that six and a half to, to eight and a half region. And it always looks like a mess unless it's one really, really clean peak. So, and so this would be for ethyl benzene. So this is not a specific, a terribly complicated looking 
aromatic, which is why we don't need to worry about things like the, uh, a lot of times the overtones get lost in carbonyl peaks. If you have a carbonyl compound, it's gonna be right in here as well. And that can make it harder to see these. But this is the one that's really, really easy to see. RJ? Uh, with those overtones, is it possible to have both of those signatures show up where it has the, or sorry, like the overtones and then the, the peaks that you had there on the left side? Well, so let's look at another simple, simple example here. Let's, let's look at one where we'd have a carbonyl that might show up in the way. If we look at the IR for benzaldehyde, say, Benzaldehyde IR. Let's see if we can trust any of these. That looks. So here's a good example of one where you can't really trust those overtones that much. That's not it. I don't know if I grabbed the right right one or not. Here's four methoxy benzaldehyde. Um, so in this case, the overtones are there, but they're really weak. Like it's probably that and that and they're and right here. But so they're evenly spaced, but they kind of look like noise even. They can be very weak sometimes, especially when you've got a carbonyl right there. Get, it's going to get in the way and overwhelm them. Actually, it's probably one, two, and three is probably right here. And so it just gets swallowed up. And unless you know what you're looking for, you're not going to look at those and say, hey, those are peaks I should pay attention to. But what you will see, and this is what you were asking I think what you were asking, RJ, is that if you go straight up, and I can't draw a straight vertical line again, um, you are going to have a peak. And that even still is not terribly vertical. Um, but there's still a peak to the left of that, that that's going to be the CH bonds that are on the benzene ring. So so the the peak to the left of 3000 is going to be all of these these hydrogens and let me go back, switch color. The hydrogens that I drew in red are the ones that are gonna show up to the left of that 3000 mark. The peaks to the right of that 3000 mark are gonna be the methyl hydrogens at the bottom because that's an sp3 carbon. So you should see both, if you have a benzene ring, you should see both of those, you should see that the hydrogens um, above 3000 and you should also see the overtones, but a lot of times those overtones are really hard to pick out unless you're already really sure that you've got an, a benzene. So supporting evidence rather than primary evidence, if that makes sense. Um, and these other ones, again, if you have a simple-ish fingerprint region and you already are pretty sure you know what the structure is, you might be able to see some of these other peaks down in the fingerprint region. But remember, a fingerprint region is a lot like astrology. You're going to read into it whatever you think is there, right? There's so much stuff in there that you can always find some evidence to make it work. Um, so I, I don't, there's stretch, those stretches exist but it's never something you would go to a, a, a uh, IR and look for. <laughs>
fact, if we look over here, probably some of these, but it, like which of these are the ones that count? Well, who knows? There's a lot of other stuff going on in here. So again, anything below 1500, get rid of, don't, don't worry about it. That is some of the stretches, some of the stretches that cause the fingerprint region to be like that. When you get to those low energy systems, there's a ton of different vibrations that cause, um, cause different stretching and things like that in the fingerprint region. Um, but when they put them all on top of each other, it's really hard to tell what's what. And here's, here's your really good evidence. Every time, if you can get a proton NMR, proton NMR is, is your workhorse of, of OQAL, of organic qualitative, because proton NMR gives you a ton of information, both about functional groups and about the structure itself. Um, and in this case, for aromatics, you're always going to see something with large integration. If it's a if it's a mono or di substituted benzene, you know your however many things you have, you know taking up a spot on that benzene ring, it's going to affect the integration. But it's usually going to be four or five hydrogens still on that benzene ring, and they always show up in the same area between about six and a half to eight and a half. And nothing else really shows up in that area. So this is a smoking gun, just like uh, a OH group on an IR, because nothing else is really gonna get in the way. And it's very distinctive once you know what you're looking for. Um, and as, as mentioned before, splitting gets really tricky with these benzene rings with two exceptions. If you have, if it's di substituted and they're on opposite sides, you're going to get all of these hydrogens are going to wind up being equivalent to each other if X is the same. So if you have, if you have di substituted, but they're perfect, they're on opposite sides from each other, then all of your hydrogens are identical to each other, which means they don't cause any splitting like we saw in that example at the beginning of class. So if that's the case, you only get a single peak in the aromatic region because all of those hydrogens are identical to each other. So that's a, that's a really good smoking gun if it happens to be the case that you're looking at. That's going to be somewhat rare. The other case is if X and Y, X is different than the other substituent, if they're opposite of each other, though, you're going to get two unique hydrogens that will cause splitting. So for the red, the red hydrogens have one nearest neighbor. So it'll show up as a doublet. The blue has one nearest neighbor, so it shows up as a doublet. So if you get two doublets, right next to each other in the aromatic region that tells you that you've got that para substitution where your two substituents have to be on opposite sides of the ring. If your two substituents are not on opposite sides of the ring, then your splitting is just going to be a mess because you're going to wind up with all of these things splitting on top of each other in the same region. You're not going to be able to see anything and you get something that looks more like this. Right, so for a mono substituted benzene, you're going to get something that looks like this with an integration of five. For a di substituted benzene, where they're not opposite from each other, you're going to get a big mess that looks like this, except the integration is going to be four because you only have four hydrogens in that mess. So if they're ortho, if they're meta, we can't do much about it. We can't use any of the splitting to tell which of those. We can't tell them apart, really. But if they're para, if your substituents are opposite from each other, we can usually tell. There are some cases where we can, we can look at the number of signals. If, if you happen to get enough resolution that you can actually see the distinct signals in there, 
the splitting might not be that all that helpful, but you can sometimes tell just from, okay, I have two specific signals, therefore it must be para. Um, if you have your, if you have two identical substituents that are right next to each other that are ortho, you get three distinct signals in there, if you can see them, if they're not all piled up on top of each other. If you have X and Y, if they're two different substituents and they're either right next to each other or they're meta to, relative to each other, that's gonna give you six distinct signals in there, which is really hard to tell the difference between. Um, these are more, these substitution patterns are a lot easier to see in a carbon NMR because in a carbon NMR, you don't wind up with all that splitting and things being on top of each other as much. So this is where a carbon NMR is really helpful is for determining what sort of substitution you have if you have a di-substituted benzene. So if you get one signal out of your benzene ring, that means that you've got, um, or sorry, if you get two signals in your carbon NMR, that means that, um, that you, have two identical substituents and they have to be para relative to each other. If you get three signals, the only way you can get three signals is if you have two identical substituents and they're ortho right next to each other. There are two ways that you can get six signals and there are three ways you can get four signals. So this is a this is all stuff that you could work out if you drew out a structure and started counting things you guys would get to these this is just a good summary slide um and so this is also why we you know proton and carbon nmr doesn't tell us that much that the proton nmr doesn't give us this is what the pro the carbon nmr gives us that's significantly different carbon nmr allows us to figure out the substitutions on bed benzenes or at least get close to it, right? Because if you could, if all you have to do is count how many signals you have in the aromatic region, that allows you to narrow down your substitution a lot based on this chart. All right, we will start with this for more practice on Tuesday. Um, but that is the, the bulk of chapter 17 um, are things aromatic, those two reactions, and some spectroscopy stuff. So you, you will have a quiz this weekend. Um, it'll go live as soon as I double check the questions and make sure um, everything is all good to go. So sometime this afternoon. Don't forget, if you want a free Verde burrito, to email Laura. Um, if you want two free Verde burritos, then come to English and to the biochem one. Um, and other than that, everybody have yourselves a fantastic weekend. Thanks, Sean, you too. Thanks, see ya.